tonight, I want to highlight our new Master of Professional Studies in Civic Engagement. We might get it up there. Uh, the degree is it's a new degree. It's designed to provide students with advanced managerial, communication, and data skills to better engage and serve the communities they live and they work in. Uh, we're, we're recruiting students for this fall, so if you are interested, and it's never too late, uh, or if you know someone who would be interested uh, and would like more information, please contact us. You can get information either on our website or call our information center. And so now to this evening's event. And as always, before we begin, I ask that you make, check and make sure that your cell phones are muted. Uh, if you're active on social media, you can actually keep it on and tweet some stuff. Um, you can follow Learning Life on Facebook and Twitter. Our hashtag is UMNHeadliners. So in today's tumultuous and polarized political climate, journalists and the news media are often accused of bias and peddling fake news. The public, for its part, is both, and that's us, uh, we're both privileged and overwhelmed by having access to more sources of information than ever before, although we don't always take advantage of them. By tradition, or as I thought, at least in theory, the press has been the watchdog of government, the seeker of truth, and the champion of the right to know. Yet, public confidence in the news media is, uh, as an institution has declined, and threats to press independence, not only in the US, but throughout the world, continue to escalate. So, is the media the enemy of the American people? Will the First Amendment to the US Constitution continue to provide journalists, uh, protect journalists as they perform their jobs? Can democracy survive without a free and responsible press? These are questions often asked by tonight's speaker, Professor Jane E. Kirtley. Her most recent work centers on the role of the media in the era of both believe me and disinformation. You have no doubt seen or heard Professor Kirtley quoted in the news. She's the director of the Silha Center for the Study of Media Ethics and Law in the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at the University of Minnesota. She is also an affiliate faculty member in the university's law school. Prior coming to the university, Professor Curley was executive director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press for 14 years. Before that, she was an attorney in Rochester, New York and Washington, DC. And she remains a member of the New York, the Washington, DC and the Virginia bars. Jane received her JD from Vanderbilt Law School and I found out she and I are both uh, Hoosier natives. She grew up in Indianapolis. I grew up not far from there, so that's good. Any other native Hoosiers in the crowd? Oh, well, my wife, yeah, and one way in the back, so. <laughs> That's cool. So anyhow, she received her JD from Vanderbilt University. She's written friend of the court briefs in media law and freedom of information act cases, as well as articles and chapters on media law and media ethics for scholarly journals and popular and professional press outlets. Her media law handbook was published by the US Department of State in 2010 and has since been translated into nine languages. She co-authored the textbook Media Ethics Today published in 2016. Jane is a recent Fulbright Scholar to the University of Latvia in Riga and a Pulitzer Prize juror. So please help me welcome Professor Jane Kirtley. Good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. I hope the mics are working properly. Yes? Can you hear me? OK, great. Um, so I thought, uh, given all of the interest that we have here by this huge turnout, rather than me starting out with a long introductory uh, set of comments, I thought I'd kind of turn the tables and ask you all a couple of questions. And um, you can raise your hand or not, you know, as you choose. But uh, what I'd like to ask to begin with is, who gets their news from newspapers? And that could be the Star Tribune, it could be the Washington Post, it could be the Wall Street Journal, the Guardian, you know. And this is a very interesting response because I can assure you that if I asked this question in, among my undergraduates, we would be lucky to see one or two hands, seriously. Okay, and of course, it does, you don't have to limit yourself to one. You know, raise your hand for any and all. Um, how many people get their news from broadcast news? NBC, CBS, PBS? Okay, 
And how many of you get your news from cable, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, CNBC? Okay, so now we've pretty much exhausted the old media, right? Because we're all of a certain age, right? I just had cataract surgery two weeks ago, something that I'm sure many of you can identify with. Okay, so what about so-called new media? How many people get their news from some form of the digital world? And let's start, or you can take your hands up or down as we go. How many of you just you know, go to, to, to websites, digital websites, and that's the way you get your information? And that might be a traditional news organization or it might be something else. You, know, you might be going to Breitbart for all I know. You know that's fine. Okay. How many of you instead get your news through a social media feed, like Google or Facebook or something? Sorry, Google, Facebook, something like that. How many of you get your news that way? Not as many. And again, my students tend to get their information, using that term loosely, from that. Okay, now I have, I think, what I think is the critical question. Why do you go? to those sites? What, what causes you to turn to those sites? What is it that makes you decide that that's where it's going to go? And there are mics here. And if somebody is willing to stick their neck out and get the discussion started, why do you go to whichever site you choose? We're not, we're not judging here. I just want to know why. Yes, thank you. Ha habit. Habit. <laughs> A traditional oh newspaper. I'm just used to reading it in the morning. That's how I always did it. So do you just, do you subscribe to the traditional Star Tribune? You get yeah, this, yeah, and it's delivered to your home. Yeah. seven days a week. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you are, you know, very close to extinct. I think, if not, <laughs> if not an endangered species. Okay, so local newspaper. Okay, somebody else. Uh, I'm another old guy who's used to close to extinct. Okay. And I get it from the newspapers, Star Tribune, New York Times. Mm -hmm. And I get it because somebody does it in depth. There's a name on it. And I feel that somebody can back up that information rather than just making some idiotic statement for which there's no data or, or support. So it's, it's a credibility issue? Is that, or a credibility reason? Yes. Is that fair? OK. Uh, another example, preferably somebody who's not saying that newspapers are their fine primary source, not that that's not good, it's music to my ears and to the American Society of Newspaper Publishers, but you yeah, know, I, um, I, I suspect some of you are getting it other ways. Yes? Yes, uh, I look at uh, uh, digital media mm -hmm. through aggregator sites, and they include left, right, up, down, front, mm -hmm. and back uh, collections of news information, so it isn't just one particular slant, it's mm -hmm. many, many different. That's a really interesting response because it presumes something that I suspect many of you in the room might also presume, which is that necessarily a news source, even one that you might find credible, is going to have a slant. That was the word I think you used. Okay. Somebody else who gets their news from another source that we haven't yet talked about. Jane on your left. There are so many people here. I'm sorry. It's overwhelming. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Over there. Yes. Um, I like to read my news electronically um, versus watch it. So even if there is a video, I mute it because I personally feel sometimes people's voices, visions of them can be biased and like give you a perception in your head before you actually hear the, you know, the facts. Mm -hmm. Um, so I like to just read it, no nonsense, just the, just the text. Okay, and so you're the opposite of the students who complain to me that I'm not using enough audio-visual things in class because they're visual learners and they can't yeah. be expected to actually read a book, it's right? It's hard, it's hard, <laughs> yeah. I'm in the middle of that, so like yeah. growing up, you know, internet wasn't really that big of a deal, but now it is. Right. Um, and, and yeah. I mean, that's, that's the medium you're using, but what, what are you, what are you consuming? I mean, what's the source of that? Is it coming, is it like oh. the, the gentleman over there who talked about getting his news from aggregators that brings together a variety of sources? What, what's, what's your ultimate source as opposed to the platform you're using? I don't necessarily have an ultimate source. Um, I like a lot of local newspapers like Star Tribune has a website. Um, I'll read articles from there, from CNN, from okay. 
I like a lot of business news too. All so right, Wall Sunday. Street Journal. Do you yes. shell out to subscribe to them? I actually do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> see, great. I mean, they, they figured that out, you know, before anybody else did, and uh, they were able to exploit it economically in a way that other news organizations are still struggling to do. And you know, they I, they knew who their audience was, and their audience knew what they had to offer, and they were prepared to pay for it. And that is one of the big issues for the news media today that they cannot figure out how to monetize their content. Those are words that I really hate. I don't think of news as content, but that's, that's the jargon. Okay, one more person who maybe gets their news from uh, cable or broadcast, something like that. I, I get my yes. news from either broadcast television or NPR, okay. largely because I distrust somebody who's filtering the news based on what they think they know about me based on what they think they know about you? Is yes. that what you said? And you're referring there to the idea of what? Facebook and other venues like that that, that have information on me and filter the news to that. Yes, they, they tailor your feed tailor. based on what they think you think. You know, it's sort of like when Amazon tells you, you know, these products may be of interest to you. <laughs> They're not just trying to be helpful. They're basing that on all kinds of algorithms that make them predict that you're likely to want that. And that may be one thing if you're talking about buying shoes. I think, at least for some of us, it's a little creepy to think that the news and information we're getting is being tailored to us. And as Bob said in his very kind and way too long introduction of me, I think that um, uh, this whole question of our, our situation where we now have so many news sources, again, putting that sort of in air quotes, news sources to which, from which we can draw, but which in fact means that instead of feasting at that huge table, we're actually choosing to go to, a, for most of us, a limited number of sites. I mean, somebody that's at a news aggregator is probably being exposed to more, but for many people, you know, it's, it's gonna be like the gentleman who said he subscribes out of habit to the Star Tribune. You can get to the point of subscribing, either literally or figuratively, by out of habit and only going to one particular news source. Uh, looking around the room, I think I can hazard that for many of us, we remember a time when there were three or maybe four national news networks and we would gather around the TV in the evening and whether it was Huntley Brinkley or Walter Cronkite or John Chancellor or whoever it was, we had a, a basically a, a common baseline of what the facts of the world were. And, you know, there are lots of reasons, I suppose, you could say why that approach doesn't really seem to ring true anymore. Um, a lot of people blame it on the abolition of the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, that happened during the Ronald Reagan administration, Republican administration, as part of the major deregulation that was you know, part of his presidency in a lot of ways, but it included the Federal Communications Commission. And what that meant was that um, the old rule that had said that news organizations broadcast had an obligation to cover controversial issues of public importance and then the flip side of that to give responsible individuals an opportunity to respond. And it was a way that ensured that news organizations would, if they took positions or if their guests or people they interviewed took positions, that the news organization would provide the other side. I mean, again, we're, we're simplifying it here to suggest there, there are two sides. Of course, we know there can be many, many sides. But the big idea was that you would have a diversity of viewpoints. And it was predicated on the idea that broadcast the broadcast spectrum was really something that didn't belong to the person that had the license. It belonged to us. It was a public resource. And that public resource had to be handled in a way that would advance the public interest, which included providing a diversity of viewpoints. So it all sounded really good, you know, in theory, it sounded great. The problem with it was, and I, this, in my early career, I became really involved in this because I actually was involved in some representation of television stations when I was working in Washington. The problem was that it didn't work in the way that the FCC intended because what news organizations would do would be that they would actually shy away from controversial topics because they didn't want to have 
to give that time to the responsible party to respond. So instead of causing news organizations to cover more of these important topics, which the FCC did not dictate, it was up to you as a broadcaster to decide what you wanted to cover. As long as you were making good faith argument that this was an important issue in your community, you'd be fine. But they found that they actually weren't doing that at all, or they were doing the bed bare minimum. Or you may remember the days when they would have their Sunday morning talk shows, but they would be, not like they are now, at like 11 o'clock in the morning, but they'd be at like two in the morning. But they could at least say, yes, we're covering that. Well, anyway, that was all abolished. And what was the consequence of that? Well, one of the consequences was that it opened up a whole new era in talk radio. Um, most of them were on the conservative side of the spectrum. There were a few on the left, most of which didn't succeed very well for reasons that are shrouded in mystery, I suppose. But the point was that the conservative voices became dominant voices in AM radio. And um, because there was no fairness doctrine, there was no obligation on the part of the broadcasters to provide opposing viewpoint. Obviously, you know, they varied. And, you know, I think even now you can see examples of uh, radio call-in shows that deliberately try to bring in different viewpoints, but they are not under any obligation to do so. So if I'm going to start going down the road of fake news, and I want to think of it in the American sense, to me, the abolition of the fairness doctrine is the start of that. Now, I don't want to leave you uh, confused about my own viewpoint. I'm not a believer in the fairness doctrine as a proposition because I don't think the government should be telling broadcasters or anybody else in the media what they can and cannot broadcast or report. I think that's very dangerous. But I cannot deny that it has, a, has had a significant impact in the news packages that are available to us now from a variety of, of resources. And so you've got that situation. And then we morph into something that we alluded to a little bit, which is the economic crunch that the print media are facing. After hundreds of years, literally, of running a newspaper being a license to mint money, we suddenly found that with the advent of online advertising outfits like Craigslist and so forth, that they were losing a very important part of their financial base. You know, you probably all think, and you would be forgiven for thinking, that it's subscribers that drive the economic health of newspapers, but that has never been true. Never. I mean, well, maybe in 1786 it was true, <laughs> but it's not true today. And so once you cut off the advertising base, you basically are eliminating the financial resources that news organizations need to succeed. And of course, once upon a time, most newspapers were family owned. And you know, let's not kid ourselves, those families liked to make money, whether it was the Salzburgers or the Grahams or any other, uh, the Coles. I mean, there were many, many people and nothing wrong with making money. But I think they had, and I do believe this, an altruistic approach. They believed that it was good to make money, but also that this was different from you know, manufacturing shoes or something like that, that there was actually a mission and a role that news organizations should play. But as more and more news organizations have either become publicly traded and or been gobbled up by, by you know, in some cases, multinational conglomerates, the idea of service to the community has really eroded. And by, that, by dint of that happening, we're left with a product that doesn't have a lot of meaning for people in the community anymore. So you basically you know, killed the golden goose that made you unique, that made you invaluable in a community. And you know, Bill, Bill mentioned that we're both from Indiana. I grew up reading three daily newspapers when I was in Indianapolis. There were the two Pulliam papers, the Indianapolis Star and the Indianapolis News, and there was also a Scripps Howard paper called the Indianapolis Times, and my parents took all three of them. And the city could support three different newspapers. And Indianapolis isn't a huge city. It's bigger now than it was when I was growing up there. But it's, it, it's not a giant metropolitan area. But you know, just as a matter of course, you knew you'd have all these newspapers. Well, now we're down to one very, very, very pale reflection of what the Indianapolis Star was when it was owned by Eugene Pulliam and his family. Um, it's now a Gannett paper. I don't mean to vilify Gannett particularly, but it's become little more than almost a, 
shopper circulator kind of newspaper and and you know it's 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 very sad to me it's it's profoundly disturbing because where do people get their local news and information when their local newspaper dies uh, you know where do they get it well you know where they're going to get it they're going to get it from social media they're going to get it from people that you know, whose identities they do not know. And I'm not suggesting that you have to be affiliated with a major news organization to be credible. Of course, it's possible that you will be extremely credible, but it's difficult, isn't it, to discern which of those sources are reliable and which of them are not. And so the decline of local media, locally owned and controlled media, I think is a huge contributor to the cry of fake news because now it's so much easier to say in this competitive marketplace the way we're going to grab ratings, grab, grab what ad dollars are left, grab viewers is by having a point of view. Not just in our editorial pages but in our approach to the news in general. Now there's nothing inherently sinful about that. There are other countries around the world that have always had partisan news organizations. If any of you are familiar with the newspapers in Great Britain, you know this is true. If you read the Times, that means you're one type of person or you have one set of political viewpoints. Telegraph, same thing. Guardian, something else. Daily Mail, I'm not quite sure what that means. <laughs> But the point is that, um, that the idea that you can't have a responsible press that's out there holding the government to account and so forth, if it's also partisan, I think is a fallacy. But in this country, at least since after the Second World War, we bought into this idea that you know, independence in media and objectivity in media were critical to the proper functioning of the press. It's a relatively recent innovation and it had a relatively short shelf life, if you think of it in terms of the history of, of news. Is this an irredeemable situation? I mean, are, are we going down the road to perdition, as it were, as a result of that? I, you know, I don't think so, but I do think that it does leave you open to charges that you are engaged in basically withholding news and information from the public if it does not suit whatever political agenda you are accused of having. And that's not what news organizations, in my view, are supposed to be about. They're supposed to be reporting the news without fear or favor. And if you're in the pocket of a particular political party or a particular powerful industry or whatever it might be, you're not serving the interests of the people that are at the center of your fundamental mission, which is what I keep telling my students. You know, if you're in the news business not for the purpose of self-aggrandizement or making money but to serve the public, then you're probably in the ballpark of what I think journalism ought to be. So, as to get kind of into the heart of what I want to talk about for the next five minutes or so that I have, I want to think a little bit about um, what do we mean when we use a term like fake news? What does the president mean when he uses a term like fake news? You know, he said he invented that term. Did you realize that? Um, let's be charitable and just say that's not accurate. Um, he did not invent the term fake news. Um, probably the earliest, at least Western incarnation of it was back during the Nazi era. The term, and I don't speak German, uh, but the term lying press in German was something that was used repeatedly during the rise of the Nazis to power as a way to help undermine public confidence in what remained of the free press at that time. Once it was completely taken over by the Nazi government, of course, then it was the good press. You know, it was giving people the information they needed to have. It is very scary to me to see how President Trump's embrace of this idea of fake news is taking off, not just in this country, but around the world. We've seen dictators and oligarchs in other countries putting into law either statutes or decrees or something like that that basically requires journalists not to tell fake news. And if they do, they can face all kinds of recriminations and penalties. And it takes me back to many years ago when I was in Romania. I was in Bucharest. I was doing some work for the State Department there. And we were having a meeting of people from civil society, as they call it. And there was a trade unionist who stood up and he said, I have a question for you. And he was very sincere. He said, how do we make the press tell the truth? <laughs> 
And I thought that was such a great question, although I thought it was a really naive question. You know, I was, I, you know, we're over in, in Romania after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and, and you're talking about, you know, emerging democracies in Eastern and Central Europe, and of course they're all going to embrace this with great enthusiasm. We just need to point them the way. And I thought, you know, how naive, but of course, if I'd been living under Ceausescu's regime where everything I was told was a lie, of course I would think that there must be the opposite side. There must be the truth, and that's what we want the press to tell. And I think that kind of cry from the heart that he spoke and that many, many, many of you might echo today tells me in one respect I don't lose complete hope for the idea of, of the news media independently surviving because it tells me that people know they need the truth. They need it. They crave it. They know they cannot survive as a democratic society if they don't have accurate information. But who's going to decide what's true and what's not true? That is the rub, isn't it? Because there's been talk thrown around, not only in this country, but seriously in other countries, that the government needs to set up, in the words of Orwell, a truth tribunal. <laughs> and we need to have the government decide what's true or what's not. You know, the fairness doctrine, going back to the FCC, the FCC, you know, even in its most regulatory zeal, was never in the business of deciding whether you were telling the truth or not. And the thing about things like libel law which you know, gives people the right to sue if they believe their reputation has been harmed because of a false statement. That's not about truth. Those trials are not about truth. If anybody tells you that, they're not being accurate. It's fake news. Because, truth, because libel trials are about providing a remedy for somebody whose reputation has been harmed by false statement. And the first question you ask is, was your reputation really harmed? And if it wasn't, then the court doesn't really care if you're telling the truth or not. We don't do that here. That's not what our courts are set up to do. And I would suggest to you that no governmental entity is set up to do that, no matter how benign it might appear. Some of you may have seen a story that came out the other day, and someone suggested that it might have been an April Fool's joke, because I think it actually was on Monday, about a legislature that is trying to set up a statutory uh, press commission. And this press commission is basically going to have a board that consists of current journalists and a journalism professor who will develop and enforce canons of ethics for journalism, which shall comport with industry standards regarding factual and ethical reporting. They would evaluate media-related complaints from the residents of this jurisdiction and penalize journalists by stripping their accreditation or putting them on probation. This is from Georgia. Not the country, Georgia, the state of Georgia. Where coincidentally CNN is headquartered, but I'm sure it has nothing to do with that. Now, you know, I, 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 I want to make real clear here that what is being proposed in Georgia bears zero resemblance to some, an institution you may remember, the Minnesota News Council that existed in this state for quite a number of years. It, it was uh, disbanded in 2011 for basically two reasons. One, because the news media who had financially supported it were running out of money and weren't, con weren't willing to continue to uh, underwrite it. But the other reason, which I think is more critical, is that to a great extent, the Minnesota News Council existed to provide a forum for people who believed that they had been wronged by the press. You know, somehow or another, they hadn't been fair, they'd violated their privacy, you know, something along those lines. And some of you may recall that the way it worked was that if the council agreed to accept your complaint, you had to agree that you would never bring a lawsuit based on that, that you would simply submit it to this council, which consisted of half journalists and half what the British would call great and good members of the community, who would hear the evidence and deliberate and then issue a statement about whether, in fact, journalistic ethics had been violated or not. When I was working in my old job at the Reporters Committee, I was very 
concerned about the Minnesota News Council as an entity. You probably know there was really no other organization like that anywhere else in the country. And I think it was uniquely Minnesotan in many ways. It was a kind of a outgrowth of this consensus, let's sit down and talk about it, Scandinavian slash German sort of thing. And it, and it, and it worked here, I think, you know, pretty well. Again, I, I had my quibbles with it. But I think it worked pretty well. But what I always thought was the centerpiece of it was the idea that it was giving not the powerful politician or the po powerful corporate interest, but the ordinary person an opportunity to have a voice against media that that person thought had not treated them fairly. And you know, who, who can argue with that as a concept? But what happened was that by 2011, because news organizations had become so much more interactive and were accepting comments, reader comments, and so forth, people weren't going to the news council anymore. They had their own blog, or they were filing comments on a website, or whatever it was, but they felt they were having their voices heard. And I noticed, just as an example of that, that um, back in March, I think at some point, shortly after the Mueller report um, summary was uh, released, there were some letters to the editor that the Star Tribune published, and maybe some of you saw it. And I'm just going to quote from one of it. It says, no matter what the Mueller report concluded, the hyperpartisan battle for political gain is certain to continue up to the day of the 2020 election. And I'm just going to skip to the nut of this. The mainstream media outlets have a great deal to answer for. For more than two years, our major news sources have bent over backwards to give credence to every conceivable allegation with respect to President Donald Trump. The Star Tribune is guilty of a deeply misguided journalistic performance. Front page news reports seriously impacted by the newspaper's obvious leftist leanings assured readers that the great smoking gun was just around the corner. The gun, of course, would be the facts needed to bring down a duly elected presidency. Now, somebody feels pretty strongly about what the Star Tribune's coverage looks like, I guess. But isn't that an interesting take? And I mean, I, I certainly recognize that there are people that have for a long time have had very definite views about the editorial viewpoint of the Star Tribune. But um, in this specific context, I think it is, it is really fascinating that we now have, at a time of what I can only characterize as constitutional crisis in this country, that we have people actually you know, convinced that a major non-affiliated newspaper, I mean, you know, whatever you may think about the Star Tribune, it's not affiliated with a DFL party, that they are you know, trying to take down a duly elected president. I mean, this is the kind of language that we hear in countries that have dictatorships, that we hear in countries that have oligarchs in power, and it, again, I'm not at all suggesting that this writer is not being entirely sincere or that he's a political operative. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and assume that he is sincere and he's not an operative. But newspapers deal all the time with fake letters to the editor that are being sent out by partisan groups, that are fake letters and are being ginned up by all kinds of special interest groups that want you to think that there is a groundswell of you know, grassroots reactions like this. And it's not real. So that's another thing, you know, that's not real. It's not just the news organizations themselves and their supposed fake news. It's also all of these sources of so-called information that are out there and that are not what they seem to be. And that brings me, I guess, to a couple of tips because I want to take your questions and comments now about how you can go about spotting what I would characterize as real fake news which is probably an oxymoron. <laughs> but um, I, by, by real fake news, I borrow the definition that Margaret Sullivan, who writes for the Washington Post as a media commentator, says, which is that fake news in my book is when a news organization or an individual, special interest, whatever it is, deliberately sets out to tell you something they know isn't true with the object of deceiving you. That's fake news. And I certainly am not suggesting it doesn't happen and it doesn't exist. Um, I think it does. But fake news is not what you disagree with. Fake news is not what shakes your you know, worldview or your comfortably held viewpoint that you've had for a long time. That's not fake news. And if you're you know, somebody like, say, the President of the United States, it's not fake news just because it doesn't make you look good. Um, in my book, 
Those are not definitions of fake news. Do news organizations get stuff wrong? Oh, all the time. How many millions of facts does a news organization purvey in the course of a year? And of course they get it wrong. But a news organization that is a truly, what I would call, responsible news organization is going to correct that as quickly as humanly possible. And they'll admit their mistakes and they'll own up to it. And we've seen that in the last few years, especially where news organizations, some of the outlets that are targeted most frequently by the president and his supporters are actually very quick to make corrections if they've gotten something factually wrong. The other issue that I think needs to be kept in mind is how we define what the news media are. And it's possible, obviously, to be you know, a little bit of both, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Newspapers and uh, TV stations historically have had editorials and commentaries and things like that. That's not what I consider to be news or journalism as such. It may be the basis for commentary, but when you look at cable, for example, and I'm afraid many of you do, what are you going to see? You're going to see some straight news reporting. You see it on all the cable channels. I'm not accepting any when I say that because they're, they, they do have news, but they also have a lot of commentary. Why? Well because it's pe some people like to watch, but it's also because it's relatively cheap to produce. If you have 24-7 coverage and you've got to have content up there all the time, it's a lot easier to have a bunch of talking heads spouting off on their views of the news than it is to actually going out and gathering the news. That's the practical reality. And you know, I've seen the shift, and I'm sure you have too, from where CNN was when it began to where it is today. And it's not, I'm not making a political comment there. I'm just saying it's a shift from news to commentary. And I suspect the people in this room are discerning enough to tell the difference, but a lot of your counterparts out there can't. And they are convinced that the commentary that they hear, and you know, take your choice. It can be Rachel Maddow, it can be Sean Hannity. I'm not, I'm nonpartisan on this issue. They all do it, and it's all intended to confuse you. I'm convinced of that doesn't make me happy to say that, but there it is. So for me, it's a question of defining, are we talking about news or are we talking about commentary? And if news organizations are clear about which is which, I'm okay with it. If they're transparent about what their affiliations and loyalties are, assuming that they're not to their readers and viewers, which is where, in my opinion, their loyalties should be, then that's okay too. It's when you masquerade as being an independent journalistic in enterprise whose highest mission is to tell the truth to the public that I think we have something to worry about and I think we do have something to worry about. So how do you tell the difference? How do you discern which is which? Well, there are all kinds of interesting suggestions that have come out from the International Federation of Libraries. You know, librarians like facts, and they're really good at helping us find them. And they say, for example, that you should consider the source. Click away from the story to investigate the website, its mission, and check to see basically who it's connected with, what contact information is. Figure it out who they are. Read beyond your comfort zone. Force yourself out of the sources that you routinely turn to. I mean, again, I'm sure the Star Tribune is really happy to hear that you're subscribing to it out of habit. You know, more, long, long may you do that. But <laughs> even they would probably say it wouldn't be a bad idea to look at some other sources as well. Check the author. One of you mentioned that oftentimes you see uh, things that purport to be news and don't have really any identification attached to them. Um, you like to be able to click through and find out who Joe Bloke's reporter is, what is his background, where has he worked before, what beats has he covered. And that's information you have a right to have, and you should. But you have to do it. You have to demand it. Um, sometimes, as you know, on online sites now, it's becoming more and more common that they will provide embedded links to the source material. Um, I'm thinking of this in the context of an issue that's very near and dear to my heart right now, which is the media restrictions on the coverage of the Noor Mohammed trial. And if you go to the original stories that, for example, the Star Tribune published, they provided you a link so that you could go and look at the order that the presiding judge has issued governing media and public access to the trial. So and that's a good thing. You know, it's, to me, that's great that we're able to show people the actual records and orders and court decisions and contracts that we're reporting on. If a news site doesn't do that, it raises a question. 
about whether what they're telling you is based in fact or based in fiction. This may seem obvious, but you should check the date of the story. I actually had a call the other day from a reporter at Minnesota Public Radio, and I hope I'm not embarrassing him by telling him this. He said, I want to talk to you about the decision that came down from the Minnesota Supreme Court in that libel case that's been pending for a few months. And I said, great, great, great. Of course, I'd be happy to talk to you. We'll set up a time. And then I thought, well, I'll go online, and I'll find the opinion, and then I'll read it, and then I'll know what to say. Except I went to the Minnesota Supreme Court site, and they had the orders list that came out that day, and the case wasn't on it. I knew the name of the case, and I keep going through, and I can't find it. So I went back to the reporter, and I said, you know, I just must be missing something, but I don't see this decision. And he said, oh, I went to a link from another Twitter feed, and it took me to the Court of Appeals decision, and I thought it had just come down. So, I mean, we caught that. We didn't have a conversation about a Supreme Court opinion that hadn't come down. But my point is that even a, a, a trained journalist can, you know, inadvertently find themselves reading an out-of-date story that may have been overtaken by events. So dates matter. They really do. And then this may be obvious, but is it a joke? I mean, there, are, there are, uh, in the olden days, you know, when The Onion first got started, there, there were instances where particularly readers in other countries thought that The Onion stories were real. There are those who have suggested that given the current state of our politics, The Onion no longer has any work to do. <laughs> but the point is, sometimes things actually are satirical. They actually are set up to be humorous, you know, not necessarily to deceive you, but are packaged in such a way that they might be. And I mention it because, seriously, people can be fooled and, and misled or, or just make a mistake. And then I think, you know, ask for help if you need some guidance. I'm not suggesting I'm the person to tell you what to read. But there are people out there, librarians and others, that can provide you ideas about alternative ways to find information that, again, might challenge your assumptions. And then finally, and I think this is an important thing, we hear the term biased media all the time. And I would just suggest that you might want to check your bias, too. We all have bias. You know, it's one of the things that journalists work very hard, I mean, real journalists work very hard to compensate for. You know, that's why you have editors, so that if a reporter comes in with a story that has basically fulfilled that reporter's expectations and it's really neat and it's really tight, that the editor will say, wait a minute, I have to ask you, you know, what's the basis of this? I mean, think about the Jesse Smollett matter in Chicago a few weeks ago. I would say that, you know, based on my own training as a journalist when I went to Northwestern Medill School of Journalism, my immediate reaction was, this is just too neat. It cannot be real. It just can't be real. And, you know, the way the Chicago media covered it was very interesting because they all dutifully covered all the statements that the police were making. And you may recall that the police at least initially, were very respectful of, of Smollett, and, and they kept referring to him as Mr. Smollett, and they said, this is what he's saying, and we're investigating it. It was very even-handed, very professional. And the Chicago media dutifully reported that, but they also were doing what Chicago media do best, which is that they were going behind the scenes to try to find out what was really going on. And it was they who basically blew open all of the big holes that were in Jesse Smollett's story. That's what the press is supposed to do. That's what we're there to do. But my point is that when that story was being reported, and you know it, there were people who immediately, in the polarized world we lived in, jumped on one side or the other. He's a horrible victim of a racist conspiracy inspired by the Trump administration. Or he's a liar. This can't be true. He's just a two-bit actor trying to get his moment of fame. And was there anything in the middle? Not much in terms of the news coverage. And I think that shows that we all are vulnerable to looking for a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in any story that touches us in one way or another. So I do encourage you to, to check your biases as you're out there looking um, for information and for news sources. I'm fumbling with all my papers here because I literally, you know, this is, this is such a breaking news situation that I, I picked this up, you know, right before I came here. But I, I'm going to close my remarks with just an observation. You know, I talked about what I see as the really dangerous situation with the demise of local media and what impact that has on society. 
And um, there was a, an interesting quote that I came across the other day, and it's from, of all people, and I don't know this guy personally, but I mean just in terms of what his, uh, his role in life is. His name is Keith Pritchard, and he's the chairman of the board of Security Bank of Pulaski County in Waynesville, Missouri. And he's, he was responding to the fact that their local newspaper, which was called The Daily Guide, died. It went out of business. And it was quoted in a story that the Associated Press ran earlier this month. And this is his quote. Losing a newspaper is like losing the heartbeat of a town. And I think that's right. And losing the media and losing confidence in the media is, frankly, a knife in the heart of our society and of our democracy. And so I hope whatever ill will you may think you have against a particular news media outlet, or maybe the media writ large, you remember that without it, as Thomas Jefferson says, we really cannot have a functioning system. We depend upon the press to tell us the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I already have a question, but I'm not quite ready for you yet, so uh, thanks very much for that. I, I, I think you all know this is a moderated discussion that we have, and so I ask you to raise your hand, wait for a microphone to get there. And uh, I think you all know, especially with a large crowd, there are always lots of people who want to participate, so if you can make your questions quick and we allow Jane a chance to answer those, we'll get to as many as we can. But having said all that, I'm going to actually start with the first question. For those of you who were here last time, uh, we, we heard uh, Tom Hansen talk about, at the very end, he, he mentioned the, this phrase, deep fake. You remember that? Yeah. And he said, he said, ask Jane when she comes. She'll know about this. <laughs> and, and, and I so, said, thanks a lot. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So <laughs> she, she's forewarned, but um, I actually had to learn a little bit more about it. So I, I looked it up, and uh, if you don't know, if you weren't here or whatever, uh, here's, here's sort of a uh, hybrid definition of deep fake. It's a technique for humi human image synthesis based on artificial intelligence. It's used to combine and superimpose existing images and videos on top of other images and videos. So think about very, very sophisticated photoshopping, if you will. Uh, and the combination results in a video that can depict people saying things or performing actions that never actually occurred. So you can imagine how this could be used to deceive people. Uh, so, Jane, the, the question for you is uh, whether this practice has been addressed in the world of jur journalism, and if so, what are people thinking about it? Well, the, the short answer is that I, I, and I, since you prepped me on this question, I was able to do a little research. Um, there was an article in uh, Columbia Journalism Review on which um, a professional journalist of considerable standing said, this is not an issue. This is not a problem. We in journalism will be able to tell the difference between fake video and uh, real video. It's not a problem. Um, I think he's whistling in the dark. I, I, I don't think that that is at all true. Um, the people that know much more about the technology behind this than I do, because I'm, I'm a Luddite, I don't know how any of this stuff works, have said that it, it hasn't really been perfected yet. And so at this point, it actually is discernible. If, if you're the kind of person that understands how this technology works, you can figure out if it has been basically artificially created using artificial intelligence. But the time is going to come when that's not going to be true anymore. The sophistication of um, not only people in this country, but many people in other countries, is rising to a level now that it really is going to be very difficult to deal with this. Um, a human rights uh, person who I saw quoted in a story said, um, we're a long way from having to deal in a meaningful way with deep fakes, but we already need to be dealing with what he calls shallow fakes, which are the less sophisticated kinds of fake videos and photographs that have actually been pretty pervasive since the advent of the internet. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the pictures, you know, um, the shark in the Hudson River, those kinds of things, where people have done photoshopping and so on. But I saw a piece uh, within the last couple of weeks of something that basically created what looked like uh, former President Obama giving one of his addresses. And the entire thing had been faked using video uh, that was really of him, using a voice actor who was able to replicate his voice. 
and saying truly outrageous things. And I'm going to bet you that there are people out there that have watched that and are convinced that it's real. So this is a very frightening thing. And I just I want to get to questions, but I want to make sure I get to say this before uh, the time runs out and I may not have an opportunity to do so. I think it's really important that we not discount the impact of foreign interests and you know their American um, fellow travelers who are engaged in a very focused and very sophisticated disinformation campaign. Whether it's to destabilize us as a, as a society, which, which I believe it is, or whether it's actually gain, aimed at getting a particular candidate elected to office or whatever it might be, it is pernicious and it is very, very dangerous. And if you're skeptical, I'll just tell you, I was skeptical too. When I was in Riga in 2016, in March of 2016, remember what was going on then, we were having all the primaries and everything, but nobody had actually been nominated yet. One of my students, who was from St. Petersburg, Russia, came up to me one day and said, Professor Kirtley, you know the Russians are messing with your election. And I said, oh, Alexandra, I don't think so. You know, surely not. How would they do that? Well, now we know. And she knew in the spring of 2016. So it's really important that we not discount that that is having a definite impact on how we think, how we vote, and frankly, how we relate to one another. And I'm nervous about it because I've done enough work in the former Soviet Union and other countries to see that this is not something that they just started doing last year or two years ago. It's been going on for a very long time and it's very sophisticated. And I saw it in Latvia firsthand. So again, this is not a partisan issue to me. It isn't really the question of did the Russians support President Trump. That's not my question. It's do the, do the Russians have an agenda to destabilize our society, the society in the United Kingdom, the society in other parts of Western Europe? And I think, to me, the evidence is pretty overwhelming that they do. Anyway, All right, so into Brandt. All right, so we're ready for a question uh, clear in the back here. Hello. Where are you? I'm in the very in the back. back. Okay, thank you. My question is on libel and slander laws. I was taught that libel and slander meant written or spoken defamation of character uh, that resulted in some harm to someone. If that is still true, why aren't those laws used more to shut down particularly egregious things like uh, the Sandy Hook families being stated by Alex Jones that they had staged these things? Now they're suing, right. but why don't people use that more? Can you just not find a lawyer to represent you to do oh, it? Oh, no, you can find a lawyer to represent <laughs> you. That's not the problem. Um, you know, we lawyers, you know, we're shameless. We'll represent anybody. No, um, you left out one point in your, def in your otherwise excellent definition, which is that it's got to be false. And it might, as we were talking before about trying to figure out what's true, what's false, and so forth, remember that a lot of the things that people say, whether it's the Sandy Hook things or any number of things, would probably fall into the category of an opinion. They couch it in terminology that makes it appear to be a point of view, which again, I mean, just to give one example, and I'm not really singling him out, but I just know it, Rush Limbaugh, for example, has many, many listeners, very devout followers who believe every word he says. If you ask Rush Limbaugh, he will tell you he is not a journalist. He says, I'm an entertainer. That's what I do. And he falls back on that, would fall back on that, if he were to be sued for libel, because he would say, I'm just expressing an opinion. I'm just having a good time, you know? Now, that may seem cruel and horrible, and I absolutely get where people are coming from if they feel that way, but it flows from a constitutional idea that is critical, I believe, to our society. And we're all enlightened as a result. <laughs> which is, oh, right, which is that there is, as a Supreme Court justice wrote, there is no such thing as a false idea. However pernicious an opinion may be, we rely upon competing opinions to help us reach the truth. And the danger of punishing opinion, however 
ill-advised, however hurtful, how awful it might be, is that it becomes a vehicle for the government by means of the courts to suppress minority viewpoints. And minority viewpoints, you know, I, I, tell, I tell my students about this all the time because they're too young to remember. I say, you know, when the great Supreme Court decision in libel law, New York Times versus Sullivan came down, it was at the, in the middle, in the midst of the civil rights movement where what everyone in the South, well not everyone, but many people in the South were trying to do was suppress those who were dissenting against the segregation system that existed there in the name of all kinds of things, but one of the things that they did in their suit against the New York Times was saying, you were not telling the truth. And so you can see that if we open the door to the idea that you can be stopped for expressing, a, stopped or punished for expressing an opinion, that we're really leading ourselves down the path that says, only, I hate this phrase, but I'll use it, politically correct opinions can be expressed. I share the concern and the frustration that you raise. I don't know what's going to happen in Alex Jones's case. I mean, I think right now he's claiming in part of his defense that he was psychotic when he made these statements. <laughs> Good luck with that, but um, it, it's not exactly a traditional libel defense. Okay, great. I have a question right here. Yes. Uh, I'll try and keep this brief, but uh, I, when I was growing up, it was in the days before television, and I got my news, besides the newspaper, from the newsreels, which was, nobody's ever mentioned these days. It's been a long time since Saturday I've seen one. Saturday afternoon at the movies. <laughs> okay. Uh, the news at that time was censored because of the war. Yes. But even after the war, it was vetted very strongly by two or three sources before the editors would let it go to press. With the advancement of social media, nothing is vetted, nothing is verified. You can say anything you want regardless of whatever other rules there are, which there aren't any. And <clears throat> I'm going to add something in here. A guy back in 19, around 1917 was very active. And he made a very distinct quote. He said, a lie repeated often enough and loud enough soon becomes perceived to be the truth. Right. And for those who don't know who said it, it's Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. And Goebbels and shortly said something very similar as Soviet well. The Soviet Union was established at the established Department 9, the Department of Mis Disinformation. Right. Well, I don't know quite how to unpack that, um, but I, I, I'll just make a couple of observations. I mean, you're absolutely right that during the Second World War, um, the news media, you know, people like Walter Cronkite and the Murrow Boys who were covering the war in both the Pacific and the European theaters, the, the newsreels were subject to censorship. But of course, there was also a very practical side to that, which was the technology was not such that you could instantaneously report. I mean, you couldn't transmit pictures the way we can now instantaneously over satellite or the internet. So as a practical matter, by the time that footage, some of which was actually shot by the Department of Defense and, and the military operations with, you know, uh, filmmakers who had been basically drafted into service, people like Frank Capra, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but I, that whole thing fascinates me. But anyway, the point was, it would be weeks before you would see that in your newsreel. So, if there was a concern about sort of the immediate impact of undermining national security or the safety of military operations, that wasn't going to happen because it simply didn't, didn't reach the American or any other public in, in that kind of timely fashion. You know, the British had it too, and of course the Germans did as well. You then raise the issue of kind of multiple sourcing and vetting and so forth. And of course, you know, the, the kind of traditional idea is the three source rule. You don't report something unless you're able to verify it with three distinct sources. And that's still a very good rule of thumb. But I think the other point that you've made, which is a really important one, and I probably should have said something affirmatively about this, is that the media, the social media that are providing us with news feeds and so forth today are not traditional news operations. Mark's, Mark Zuckerberg is not in the business of being a purveyor of news. 
You know, neither are the people that are running Google. And they're running into all kinds of regulatory issues in Europe where they don't have a First Amendment and the ability to do the kinds of things that these American companies do here, for the most part with impunity, it, they're being cracked down on by uh, go European regulators. And I just saw a story this morning about a leaked report that uh, was reported in the Guardian newspaper about the fact that there are plans to be published on Monday that the UK government is going to legislate a new statutory duty of care that will be imposed upon social media companies like Facebook, like Google. It will be policed by an independent regulator and guess what? Be funded by a levy on media companies. So in other words, the companies themselves are going to have to pay for this regulatory uh, entity. <laughs> There's a company, there's already a regulator in Britain now called Ofcom that regulates uh, broadcasters and they're saying this is probably what is going to be the inter intermediate um, step on the regulator. Now, I can tell you right now, this would not fly in the United States constitutionally. It would never work. It probably will work in Britain as a matter of their law, but of course what will happen is all these social media companies are going to fight it tooth and nail. But here's the thing, they're fighting on multiple fronts, and you probably know this, because especially now that there's a, a Democratic majority in the House, the, government, the federal government of Congress is now looking at more regulation of these social media companies. In some respects, I don't have a problem with that, especially in terms of their privacy policies or lack thereof. But I do get nervous about the government stepping in and regulating their content any more than they would regulate, for example, broadcast media. No, no, broadcast media can't broadcast obscenity, for example. That's against the law in the United States. They get in trouble. They can lose their license if they do that. But in terms of political viewpoint and so forth, that's not something that the government gets to regulate. And the idea that you can broadcast and determine even what harmful content is, whatever that means, and crack down on it and, and fine people for doing it is simply not consistent with um, our, our legal scheme here and the way the Constitution has been interpreted. Um, I don't have any great ideas how we're going to deal with this situation, but I guess what I started to say was, and I didn't finish the thought, is this, that as I was talking about, the tradition of news media in this country has been, you know, family-owned, looking to make a buck, but with this altruistic mission. That's not the mission of these people. And I remember back in the early days of sort of the internet and so forth when CompuServe and some other outfits were starting to do work in Europe and China and other countries. It was very clear that they had absolutely no interest in preserving First Amendment values unless it was something that they needed to make money. They weren't doing it on principle, they were doing it for money. And it's, a, in my mind, a very dangerous situation because whatever you think of a paper like the New York Times, for example, or the Washington Post, they were the ones who litigated some of the most important cases that guarantee our right to get access to information from the courts, for example, to uh, enforce the freedom of information law, to guarantee our rights of free speech. Are the Facebooks and Googles of the world doing that? I don't think so, and that's a big gap. Anyway, okay, long Viv response oh, to your question. Vivian's got a... Actually, I do oh, first. Okay, please. back yep. here. All right. Hi, you've done a terrific job uh, dealing with a fraught topic in a very even-handed way. So now I'd like to make things a little bit difficult for you. <laughs> I'm having those, a great time. In those terms, <laughs> okay. So if you look at fake news and disinformation and you include in it things like radicalization of the news inclusive of misinformation and disinformation and uh, you worry about the degree of allegiance of a core of uh, viewers and listeners to those sources such that um, it seems to many of us that reality is absent and you identify that as a problem. Are we dealing with a symmetric issue in terms of the partisan divide or an asymmetric issue? Some of the information that I've seen that seems rigorous, solid, and objective, like from Berkman Klein Center and so forth, seems honestly to attribute it more to one side than the other, and specifically the right. Um, do you think that that is valid or not? Well, 
that's a tough question for me to answer because I don't think I can answer it in an objective, balanced, you know, way. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment that suggests that I've been been that way so far this evening. Um, I have I have very strong views about one particular cable news operation because I do believe that they engage in what I would call disinformation. I think they are not accurate. I think they are, and, and deliberately so. Again, I'm not talking about good faith mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But I'm saying the deliberate choice of news, lack of news and so forth, I think is problematic. And again, I'm, I'm going to dodge your question a little bit by simply drawing an analogy. I mentioned that I was in Latvia. And if you know Latvia, you know that they've still got a substantial Russian-speaking population there. There are people that stayed there after the Soviets pulled out. That's their home. That's where they live. But because of some kind of, in my view, really ill-advised laws in Latvia, and it was a reaction to the fact that this Russian minority was seen as problematic, there are laws that say you cannot have Russian language media that is based in Latvia. It's, it's against law. If you want to have your newspaper published in Russia, you can't do it. So I was doing a forum with some students at the University of Latvia, and I sort of suspected the answer to this question, but I thought I would ask it, which is, I said, how many of you come from homes where the primary language is Russian? And it was about a third of the students. Most of them were Latvian, and because they all spoke English or they wouldn't have been in this program. So I said, OK, so given that there's no Russian language media in Latvia, where do your parents or your grandparents, whoever it is in your family that doesn't speak Latvian and doesn't speak English, where do they get their news? RT, the Russian cable network, Sputnik, another Russian cable network. And one of the students raised her hand and she said, and my grandmother believes that the Russians went into the Ukraine as liberators. And it doesn't matter what I say to her because that's what she learned from RT and Sputnik. Now, Obviously, the Latvian situation is distinguishable from ours. I don't mean to suggest it's identical, because even in Latvia, you have a choice of multiple outlets. But the problem is that because of this language barrier, in fact, for that Russian-speaking population, who many you know, Latvians think is problematic, because they, I mean, they told me when I was there, if the Russians invade, you know, that chunk of the country where this Russian language uh, speaking population is, they're going to rise up and greet them as liberators, and we're going to have a real problem. And you have that problem for many reasons, of course, that are way beyond my, beyond my pay grade, but it's partly because they don't have access to the other point of view. In this country, we have access to any point of view we want. And you explain to me why somebody says, but I get all my news from Fox because it's the only one I can believe. I don't know what you do with that. I truly do not know. Um, I, I, it, ner it makes me nervous when anybody says I get all my news from any single outlet. But Fox strikes me as being one whose commitment to what I would consider to be legitimate, independent news reporting, it's just not there. Um, but I will say, well, but I will say with this, that with this one caveat, I have noticed that when they're covering a straight breaking news story, they're probably doing as good a job as any other news outlet. But the problem is that so much of what's on Fox today um, is commentary. It's really not news reporting. And for many viewers, the two are one and the same. There's no distinction. So I don't have a solution. I wish that I did. I don't think the solution is for the government to shut them down. In fact, I'm quite sure that's not the solution. I guess the only solution I can posit is the one that, again, librarians and others say, which is the whole notion of media literacy, training people to be able to make those distinctions. And that, I think, is a place where, and I'm speaking broadly here, our educational system has really let us down. OK, you have a question over right in the front there where Vivian is. Yes. Just back to that point about Fox, there was an ex, uh, excellent... I really didn't want to turn this into a Fox no, no, I'm not. Session. I'm just saying there was an ex excellent article about that in the New Yorker about two weeks ago. So that's a good place to go to if you're interested in that. The other thing that I That lefty publication, the yeah. New Yorker, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing I, I was going to ask you is, do you think that the deep fake or an attempt at a deep, deep fake 
is going on at all from the United States side in Venezuela involving Maduro? I can't answer that question specifically. I don't know. But, you know, let's not kid ourselves. Um, going all the way back, and I mean, again, I'm, I'm revealing kind of my age and mindset, going back to the COINTEL program during the 1960s, we know that the U.S. government um, in a variety of guises has used disinformation campaigns domestically and internationally. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe, maybe we can ask Edward Snowden, maybe he'll know. <laughs> Everyone way over there where Christine is next to the wall. Up against the wall, yes yeah. sir. Yes, Thank against you. the wall. Um, I'd like to bring it down to a very narrow subject for you. Your students, how do you advise them where to go to get a job and how to act when they get the job? <laughs> um, what do you mean how to act? You mean like I tell them, don't wear open-toed sandals when you go for your interview? Or? <laughs> I'm not making fun of you. I just want to want to understand what you mean. But they obviously, given the uh, comments that you have about the uh, media, they're going to be challenged about fake news, about their sources, about what they uh, can and cannot submit for publication. How do they deal with that? Well, you know, I teach, I teach media law. I also teach, as you heard, I teach media ethics course as well. And I bring in lots of practitioners and in the book that I co-wrote with Chris Eisen, who uh, some of you may remember when he was at the Star Tribune, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. We talk a lot about just good journalistic technique. And, you know, one of the toughest things to convince young journalism students to do is to get away from the computer to put down their smartphone and to go and talk to people face to face. Because we tell them how it's so easy now via email to be fake. I mean, you've all gotten the Nigerian Prince emails, haven't you? <laughs> and th when somebody, and it's usually a student, contacts me uh, to do an interview or something, and they would say, and I can do this by email. You know, we don't have to even talk on the phone. I say, how do you know that I'm who I purport to be? How do you know that I'm not just making it up as I go along? And I say, if you were my student, I'd tell you this is an unacceptable way to do news gathering. I mean, I've certainly have been, you know, given interviews via email to reporters before. I do it with local reporters all the time. But there are people I already know, and they already know me. We've established a connection. But the scary thing, and, I, and the students are getting a lot better at this than they used to be, but there was a time when the students were really of the school that said, if it's on the internet, it must be true. And so a big part of our job was to tell them that that's not the case, and that they need to use some of the techniques I talked about to try to discern the difference between something that's reliable and something that's not, something that's true and something that's not. And um, a couple of very famous journalists, uh, Rosenstiel and um, I'm forgetting the name of the other one right now, but I used the book in my class, came up with uh, a whole kind of series of checklists about how you go about determining whether something is reliable or not, whether it's truthful or not. And these are not limited to the new media, nor are they so old that you throw them in the wastebasket. So we spend a lot of time talking about that kind of thing and underscoring the notion that if the news media are to survive, the only thing that they really have to offer that these panoply of other sources don't is credibility. And if you lose that, then you're out of luck. That's why we're so strict in the school about things like plagiarism. We have a zero tolerance policy. Why? Because we're mean? No. Because we know that if a journalist gets out there and plagiarizes, they've just committed career suicide. And so, it's a, and it's a credibility issue. So there are all kinds of things. I mean, I could go on and on about um, sort of what the reality is in the new media world. I wasn't sure where you were going with your question initially when you said, you know, where, where do they go to get a job? And that's a great question because, you know, the, the market to find uh, a place to do journalism is shrinking. 
and it's harder and harder to get jobs in kind of the conventional sense that I took for granted when I was at Medill. You know, everybody went to work for a newspaper or a TV station, and, and you know, that's what you did. Um, that's not really possible anymore. And so more and more of our students are, are drifting into more of an entrepreneurial kind of thing. They're, they're, they're becoming you know, freelancers, gig economy, that kind of thing, and working on their own. And there are good things that come out of that, but I think you lose the kind of cohesion that we have enjoyed in the traditional media model. And you know, again, if I could solve that problem, I would be making a lot more money than I am in my current job. I have one right in front here. Hi. Related to your earlier comments about uh, Fox, how, the, the School of Journalism at the U is now called the Harvard School of Journalism. Yes, it is. He's a notorious right winger in Minnesota. He's been aligned with the Koch brothers, and part of their thing is to fund pro professorships across the country. True. And that's where Fox News is in the Twin Cities. So how did the? Uh, no, that's not right. Isn't it? Oh, I know. Hubbard. Isn't KSTP? KSTP is not a Fox affiliate. Oh. Pardon? It's not a Fox affiliate. KSTP oh, okay. is, is ABC. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm off on that one. But anyway. Fake news! <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me, uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the School of Journalism with that name on it. Well, I'm not here as the director of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, thank God. Um, I was the interim director for a short period of time when we were between directors, but it's now somebody else's problem, not mine. Um, I, I, can, I, will, I will give you the rationale that um, the school has for having named it after the Hubbards. Um, it's not named after a particular Hubbard. It's named after the Hubbard family as a whole with the idea that, and this, this is indisputable, that Hubbard was, the original Stanley Hubbard, was a pioneer in broadcast journalism. He did stuff with the early years of KSTP, both in radio and TV, that became the model for broadcast journalism all over the country. And so while his... The, his descendants uh, and current offspring that are running the place may certainly have a particular political predilection. Um, the idea is that the name honors both that history of the contribution to journalism and the fact, and this won't surprise you, that the Hubbard family has been extremely generous in its support of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. But I can also tell you that, and this probably won't surprise you either, that when the announcement was first made, there was quite an explosion from alumni and others. And I'll just tell you, and this is solely my personal opinion, do not attribute it to the school or anybody else, it's just my opinion. I think it's very dangerous to name buildings after people that aren't dead. <laughs> <laughs> because you never know what they're going to do. <laughs> and I think that's all I'm going to say about that. And, and if you've been uh, paying attention to the news around the university, sometimes it's dangerous to name them for people who are dead. So. Yes. But, <laughs> but I didn't really want to go there okay, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Vivian, you have someone back here. Uh, c considering the deep fake and artificial intelligence in general, uh, attitude of scientists and, and uh, algorithm developers is it's my job to develop the algorithm and let society sort out the results. Should the, should the um, censorship rules for uh, news organizations, for people, humans in general, extend to ever more cognizant technology? That's a great question, and one of my graduate students is actually working on that. That's probably going to be the topic of her doctoral dissertation, so I should bring her in here to answer that question. Um, I'm just going to give you my totally, you know, again, unscientific, I, I don't know science, I don't know technology, I'm really ignorant about that and proud to say it. But um, I guess my point is that I, I, I abso I've always understood uh, you know, the, the, the view of some scientists that ultimately you know, we're about creating you know, technology and harnessing the technology and it's up to the ethicists and you know, society as a whole to figure out the right way to use that. And I understand that, I'd even say I respect it, but I will suggest that it's kind of an amoral position not immoral, but amoral, 
Um, and without, and I, God, this is a dangerous thing to say, but we're all friends here. I would just say that the, the, what concerns me about that is that it's, it's not unlike the viewpoint of those who are working in a variety of scientific experiments, both in this country and elsewhere in the 1920s, 1930s, and 40s, where the mission was to find out X without thinking about what the impact would be on the humans who were unfortunate enough to be the research subjects. And so, you know, in a way, we're all the research subjects for the technology folks that are creating all of this stuff, whether it's Internet of Things, whether it's artificial intelligence in other situations. One of my grad students and I wrote a paper about our concerns about um, Internet of Things and, you know, the notion that, you know, Alexa's not just this benign thing sitting on your table, it's listening to you as well as talking to you and what's happening to that uh, data. And, you know, I'm a big believer that if you know, you know, if, if, if it's informed consent and you know what's happening to your data and you're okay with it, that's fine. But the problem is that so many of the, these companies, again, because I don't think they have any altruistic bones in their body, it's all about making money, they're monetizing your data and, as the saying goes, they will seek forgiveness rather than asking you permission before they do it. So that's probably another discussion for another night, but I would say we need as individuals and as consumers, we need to pay attention to this stuff because truly, they will do whatever they can get away with. That's the way it is. And if it's a free product, as they say, then you're the product. Uh, I'll yes. get to you in just a little bit. I have one way back in the corner there again. Way back in the corner. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I had kind of a two-part question. Well, one thing I just wanted to say about deep fakes is they're just a tool. It's all about what we're going to do with it. I think they could be used for evil and they could be used for good. Um, and then the other thing was you'd mentioned about Google and Facebook as uh, being responsible for news aggregating, and I'm not really sure that's their role. Um, so my husband actually spends a lot of time on Reddit, and Reddit's a great news aggregator, mm -hmm. and it's user-moderated, user-sourced, mm -hmm. so they'll pull from different sources. And well, it's AI-moderated, AI too, well, I guess. Yeah. So um, I just kind of wanted some of your opinions on that. Well, again, I think it, it isn't, you know, for me, you say it's not really their role. Maybe it oughtn't to be, but for many people it is by default. That's what they're turning to for that information. And when I, what my view is, they are not traditional purveyors of news. That's not what they're in the business of doing. And it's probably unrealistic to expect that they could do it. Now, can the technology be used by somebody else to do really good vetting where you're providing truthful, accurate information that is, sure, it can be. I'm just saying they're not doing it yet. And that there are people out there that are relying on it when they're not engaging in that kind of vetting. Now, having said that, you probably know that in the last few months, people like Zuckerberg have been before Congress and raised their hand and say, we're going to do it going forward. Well, I'm skeptical of that on two grounds. I, I don't believe him for a minute that they're going to do it, but even if, they, even if he was absolutely sincere, I don't think they're capable of doing it because they're not approaching it from that perspective. Reddit may very well be, but I don't think they are because that's not a, the center of their business model. That's not what they're about. The Washington Post is about cover, publishing news. You know, that's not what they're about. So it's probably unrealistic to expect them to do it. And even if they say they'll try, I don't believe they'll be able to succeed. So that's what I was driving at. And I, I don't mean to vilify them in particular, but hey, they're the ones that have the biggest reach right now, at least in the Western world. And those are the ones we have to be concerned about. Okay, right here. Um, in an age when anybody can throw something up on the internet, if they have a blog or something, pretend to have interviewed somebody, how do you define who is a journalist and who isn't and who enjoys the protections of a free press and protection of sources and so on? You know, that's such a great question, you know, who's, who is a journalist? And in other countries, you know, they tell you who a journalist is. And typically, it's somebody who's not part of the opposition. Typically, it's somebody who supports the current government. And if you 
fall into that category, then you get your license and you get to go out and do something that resembles journalists. And if you don't, then you either become part of the underground press or you go and work somewhere else. Um, I'm very wary of government making any attempt to define who a journalist is. And if you look back, I, I did a, a study of this many years ago in connection with um, a talk I was giving. I look back in Supreme Court cases, and it, you may be aware that it's a relatively recent innovation that the, the court is actually, was actually parsing the First Amendment, at least the press clause of the First Amendment. One of the most important cases where that began was from right here in Minnesota, the Near versus Minnesota case in 1931. But if you look at all of the court's jurisprudence from then until now, you will never see the Supreme Court defining what it means by the press. They never, ever say that. They kind of assume that if you're doing journalism, if you're gathering news and information for the purpose of disseminating it to the public, then you're a journalist, whether you're affiliated with the New York Times or WCCO, or whether you're, in the words of one of the justices, the lonely pamphleteer who's standing on the street corner handing out your broadsides. You're a journalist. You're the press. Now, when they were writing those opinions back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, come on, everybody knew what jur who journalists were. You know, it, it wasn't something you had to debate about. Oh, every once in a while there'd be a freelancer, there'd be a question of whether they were really journalism or whether they were an activist or something. But for the most part, it wasn't anything that we had to define. Again, very different from other countries where you know, big fat code books in countries like Germany spell out in excruciating detail what makes you a journalist and what doesn't make you a journalist. So why does this even matter? Well, it matters because there are times when being considered a journalist does make a difference. As a general rule, the laws of general applicability, the laws that apply to everybody, apply to journalists just like everybody else. But there are some exceptions. And one of the ones that probably you're familiar with in that this state, like about 30 other, 38 other states has, is a journalist so-called shield law that gives journalists special privileges not to testify if they're subpoenaed in certain kinds of court proceedings. It's more complicated than that, but that's kind of the Twitter version, I guess, of what our, our state shield law is. The question is, who gets to invoke that? And you raise the question of other kinds of speech protections. If you look at things like libel law, on the federal level, the court for the most part, the Supreme Court for the most part, really hasn't had to draw that distinction when it comes to the kinds of protections that they've recognized in cases like New York Times versus Sullivan. There are a couple of cases from the 1980s where they said, is Dun and Bradstreet, when it's publishing its, its financial reports, is, is that the press? Do they get protected like the Wall Street Journal would? So it's not like the question has never been raised, but for the most part, Remember, we have a freedom of press and a freedom of speech, and for the most part, that freedom of speech applies to all of us, not just to the press. So to a certain extent, it's a red herring to say, who's the press? Because in one respect, I think we're all the press. We all enjoy this protection, except in these highly specialized areas where the statutes are specifically geared toward providing protection to somebody who's doing journalism. And one of the big problems with passing a federal law that would give journalists the kind of protections that reporters enjoy in this state is that exactly what you're pointing to, that Congress says we don't want to have to try to figure out who's a journalist. We don't think we can. So we'll punt on passing the law because we could not figure out to whom it would apply. Um, you know, These are those kinds of philosophical questions that you could spend hours pondering. But I think the bottom line is that as long as we have a First Amendment, for the most part, it really doesn't matter. It's protection that we all enjoy, whether we're called a journalist or not. OK, great. So we're going to have one last quick, I hope, question. But before we do that, I uh, want to invite you, remind you, May 2nd, coming up, uh, the topic, uh, studying the beginning of the universe from, from the bottom of the world. Ought to be fascinating. Uh, Dr. Clem Pryke is at the University's Institute for Astrophysics and Astronomy. So we hope you can make it on May 2nd. So one last question for you, Jane, right here in the middle. Yes. Hi. Um, so I, first of all, I want to, I'm here to inform you that the YouTube video that you saw recently of the flying saucers was real. <laughs> and I was there, I saw it. <laughs> right? 
That's very reassuring. We <laughs> watched the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, put okay, the sorry. Um, well, they didn't serve wine on that ship. It was something different. Um, so I, I just wrote some bullets to, to, to ask you to guide me through your discussion. Because if you can put the mic up so this everyone can hear. This subject's been uh, driving me nuts for s several weeks anticipating your arrival. Uh, Hello Vietnam, uh, the, the movie, kind of slapstick with um, the movie nonetheless. The um, um, Radio Free Hanoi and Radio Free Europe are to me information disseminators, however true or untrue they are. In other words, I'm arguing that we do as good a job as the Russians that are coming are doing here. Um, the accountability part, the authorship, which you had mentioned and some of the other guests have said, you know, that's when news becomes reliable. Um, would, where would we really be without Deep Throat? And the more recent New York Times op-ed that talked about the government slowdown and there were others of us that were, you know, seeing the need to let this calm the waters a little bit and figure out where we're really going as a country. What's the difference between social media ownership and CBS and NBC because their news desks pick what they're going to air and what they're not to this comment about alternative news sources and a variety of them. So, so we and need to wrap this up because I know everyone's final getting anxious. wrap here, so. up on that, thank you, is when should news, real news, not really be reported? The manifestos, um, right. self-censorship maybe. Yeah. Maybe that answer that last because there's I a was going to say I, I so think that, I think the last question. one yeah. is probably you know the the one that maybe resonates with people the most because you know the Society of Professional Journalists Ethics Code says that the first obligation of a journalist is to seek truth and report it. You know journalists are not in the business of not publicizing information that they think it's important for the public to know. But having said that. And I, I was reading uh, a piece about this just the other day where someone has basically said that I believe it's the Washington Post, but it could be any of the major news media, purposely buried a story. You know, they buried a story uh, because they didn't think that the public should know about it. And that, you know, that's a journalistic sin if that's the reason that you're doing it. But we've been talking about credibility. And one of the things that at least conven conventional news media do is they do verify before they publish. I remember when um, Matt Drudge was first getting started, he published a story on his online site that was a rumor that had been circulating in Washington, D.C. that a Clinton White House staffer by the name of Sidney Blumenthal um, was an was abuser of his spouse. And he published the story, and Blumenthal sued him. And Drudge said in his defense, well, it was a rumor. Everybody was talking about it. Why shouldn't I be able to report it? Well, that's not what real journalists do, not until they've been able to vet and verify it. And you know, I will pick up just one leaf of something you said. It, I absolutely agree that particularly during the Cold War, operations like Radio Free Europe were lifelines of truthful and accurate information that reached behind the Iron Curtain and uh, helped to influence a lot of things um, that changed radically um, in the 1980s. But you also probably know that Radio Free Europe and, and similar kinds of operations are explicitly by law prohibited from broadcasting in the United States because they are considered to be by our US government propaganda. And it's not the role of the US government to propagandize its own people. So I'm not suggesting that they haven't done a lot of good. I certainly have heard that from people in those countries, and I've been an interview subject for them myself. But I guess to, again, wrap up with your last question, is there, uh, is there news? Is there information that the media shouldn't publish? Yeah, there probably is. And what I've seen in the many years I lived in Washington was that people like Ben Bradley, you know, legendary editor of the Washington Post, wrote an op-ed piece at one point explaining how when the Post got classified information, which happened a lot, 
that one of the things that they would do was go to their government sources, sometimes even the president himself, and say, what is going to be the consequence if we publish this story? And he said, and they sometimes persuaded us that the con consequences were serious enough that we should not publish the story. Now, you may not believe that. I believe it because I saw it happen many times when I was working in Washington. So yes, there is information. There is even truthful, accurate information that should not be published, or at least should not be published at a particular moment in time. But the default position of the press, and this is something a judge of the Sixth Circuit said in another con context, he said, the default position of the press is to publish because that's the only way you're going to find out what's going on. Thank you. Great. Sounds like a great place to end. Thank you, Jane. Fabulous. Thank you. I expect Jane will be here for a little bit for you to talk to her. And again, hope to see you on May 2nd. We'll hear about astronomy. <laughs>